We have Professor Laura Ray, who's going to speak to us about a decade of progress and challenges for polar autonomous robots. Thank you, Professor Ray. Thank you. Uh, so I'd like to add my welcome to uh, all the alumni and friends here. Thank you for coming back on this beautiful spring weekend, finally, in Hanover. Um, at dinner last night, today, I heard many of you refer to this space and the uh, great hall as the barn. And it brought to me, of course, the barn uh, predates me, but it brought to me visions of hordes of Thayer students working together furiously to, to meet some project deadlines, to uh, do some good work. And what I'm going to talk to you about today is just that. So this uh, work that I'm, I'm about to talk to you about briefly is really the product of what started as uh, A-B projects, the senior theses and Bachelor of Engineering capstone projects, which I think is fairly remarkable uh, about how much progress we have made. So these are our two, two robots, uh, Yeti, which was the product of two consecutive BE pro uh, projects, and the Cool Robot, which is a solar-powered robot, which actually predates Yeti by a couple of years, which was started as some uh, honors theses projects. So, um, so here we go. So first of all, why develop polar robots? Well, there are two fundamental reasons. And when we started this project, we had visions of helping science. So uh, fleets of robots that scientists could use and mount their instruments on and go rove the Antarctic Plateau. We haven't quite gotten there, but we've done some good work. But these are the science stations that are available in our polar regions to scientists, both the temporary and the permanent stations. And uh, scientists do everything from glaciology, space physics, uh, biology, uh, atmospheric chemistry, you name it. So they're very important regions and, of course, the all-important climate change. So they're very sparse. So if we can broaden the temporal and spatial region over where you, where you can make measurements, that would be helpful. The second reason was that it's really expensive to do science in these areas. So your taxpayer dollars uh, go to the National Science Foundation and NASA, and the polar program at the National Science Foundation spends 70% of their budget on the logistics, getting people to the field, getting fuel to the field, and so on, to support the science. So it's fairly expensive. So we can, if we can make a small dent in that, it would be worthwhile. So. Like any good Thayer design project, we started by looking at the state of the art. And this was the state of the art. So we have, um, is this, uh, this works. Yeah, so this is a CMU robot that was made for the Atacama Desert. Well, it didn't quite work in uh, polar regions. Okay, thanks. Oh, great. <laughs> Uh, and uh, so this is a tumbleweed, which you can put sensors inside and set it out, and it blows with the wind, and it'll blow all the way across the continent of Antarctica, but it's hard to recover, and it's not, and it's not much. So it's great for some things, but not for others. Krell has uh, built some small snowbots, which were uh, uh, good devices, again, for modest payloads. And then there's this big Volkswagen-sized Nomad robot built by CMU. Well, that's really hard to get to the place where you want it to, and it's gasoline-powered. So if you want to do clean science, it's pretty hard to do that in a gas-powered vehicle. This one actually came after our robots, and it's actually sort of a competitor. And I'll tell you why I don't look like that robot in just a second. So it's a track robot with commercial solar panels on it, weighing about uh, uh, several hundred kilograms. So, so like any good Bayer project, it, not seeing something in the state of the arts that met our need, we started with a clean slate. And, and we also had to start, of course, with understanding the environment in which we were working. And there were three fundamental challenges to working in this, uh, these harsh environments, one of which was not really temperature. We could solve the temperature problems pretty easily, actually. So one is the terrain, so uh, the sastrugi. You can see this guy sort of standing there. He doesn't sink in the terrain, so it's not like New Hampshire snow. It's not like the two feet of snow we had this winter. Uh, it's very firm snow, but it's riddled with these features that could pose a problem to mobility. Some big sastrugi we can actually see on, on uh, satellite and aerial in, in imagery and chart routes around. So we didn't have to worry about them. It was really the small stuff. We could run into blizzards and blowing snow. 
And then uh, uh, a significant one is crevassing. And this is not what crevasses look like in Antarctica or Greenland. This one has been blasted open to show. But they generally are these voids that are bridged by um, snow that could be as little as a foot thick or perhaps as much as several meters. And so you need a really lightweight vehicle to cross those without falling through. So we started from this clean slate, and I'm going to skip over a lot of the design details and show you the, show you the results again. So uh, when we started out, we actually started out with a cool robot, and for both of our robots, the objective was keep it simple. Small, light, simple. We're only working in the summer. We're not working in the winter, so it's not when it's cold and dark. Uh, it's a little cold, but not too cold for us. Uh, you're not going to run into rocks and trees, so we didn't have to have cameras. Uh, so we're focusing on mobility, not per perception. And if we could use wheels and not tracks, we'd have high efficiency and, and maximize our endurance. Yeti was designed more specifically for towing a ground penetrating radar. It's a battery power. And one of the fundamental differences between these two robots is Yeti has a suspension but it's a simple suspension. So it's just a pivot in the center so that when Yeti traverses uneven terrain, it keeps four wheels on the ground most of the time. So the mass of these robots is pretty low, so a student and I can handle them. We can pick them up and put them in the back of my minivan and cart them wherever we'd like. They're both uh, four-wheel drive. We use very simple GPS waypoint following, even at low elevation. So when we're down in Antarctica, all the GPS satellites are pretty much on the horizon, but even at the almost exactly at the South Pole, we're able to navigate via GPS. We are uh, emission free. We can tow more than our weight very comfortably. And uh, the survey speeds that we can conduct are about walking speed and a little faster, so just what we need. Yeti has an 18 kilometer range, and the cool robot is essentially unlimited on battery power, and I'll show you how that works in just a second. So to dispel the myth that you need tracks, I'm just going to play a couple of, of brief clips. Let's see. So, so uh, just to show you how they go. So this is the cool robot uh, in, I think it was probably 2013 in Greenland, uh, towing a a lightweight radar. Um, you can see it doesn't sink much, it stays on the surface. Uh, the, again, it's, it's not the same kind of snow that we have in New, in New Hampshire. And then this is a Yeti on uh, the McMurdo ice uh, shelf. Um, if you look, Yeti's coming back from a, a five kilometer transect and coming into home. And, and you can see Yeti pretty much goes on the surface of the snow hardly any tracks made, uh, and it's at this point towing a sled that's about 70 kilometers, I mean 70 uh, kilograms, um, uh, but it can do that very comfortably. <clears throat> so, and we put the bells on so we know it was coming back to camp and we have to get up and change the batteries. So, <laughs> so, um, uh, so those are our robots. So what is so unique about this? Well, when we started the Cool Robot program, we had no idea whether this was even doable. So we thought, well, do you have to have one big panel that, you, that faces the sun, that you turn with the sun? Well, it turned out that if we did have to have such a panel, that um, it would blow, blow the robot over in the wind. It was just not feasible. So, so, but of course, we're working in a snow field, not in a grass field. And so we recognize and we built models that's showing that if the, sn the sun is at this low angle, even the back panel in the shade gets reflected energy off the snow. So if we built this solar panel box on wheels, which is about what it is, then uh, the sides plus the back give us almost as much as the front. So our first generation panel box had uh, nine by six cells and gave us about 325 watts. Uh, we built that on a shoestring. We had about $30,000 for this project. So we weren't really, we didn't have a lot of money. We built the panels actually ourselves by hand. Um, but then a few years later, we actually got some money to do a second generation panel box. And at that point, the technology, the solar cell technology had improved just enough that we could actually strip off the top layer of cells, put a few more on the top, and get more power. 
out of, out of the robot. So this is our current generation uh, solar panels. And what happens is uh, this is the power we need to run at about 8 tenths of a meter per second. This is the power at different um, cloud cover conditions. And uh, so we can use the excess power that we have in, around noon to charge batteries and then use those batteries at the edges of the day. So that worked out very well. Our first outing was in 2005 in Greenland, and we achieved, at that point, it seemed very significant. Now it seems like, wow, that was not much. But we went 20 kilometers autonomously without stopping as the, the sun progressed from uh, peak down below uh, to um, late in the day. And we did that uh, pretty successfully on that shoestring, shoestring budget. So um, I'm going to jump ahead just for a second and then go back in time. But in 2013, we had finally got a science grant, our first science grant, to do some demonstration science campaigns. And we were able to uh, do about 200 kilometers at that point. So, so this is the, the 2013 robot towing a aerosol package. That was one of our science campaigns. And we did our first 24-hour overnight operation. So sent the robot out, went to bed, woke up, and there it is still uh, uh, working. One of the challenges over the years that um, I faced is that students would come, they'd do great work, and then they'd graduate. And so we had uh, two robots at that point. Actually, Yeti had come along. And uh, we had code on both robots. And it was a nightmare trying to maintain that code. So we actually made the code common between the two, two robots so that we're maintaining one set of code for both robots. Uh, as I, I talked about the panel box, uh, we had some help in packaging the electronics from uh, folks at Krell. And then we integrated our surveying with geological information systems so that we could set survey routes and then and look at them afterwards uh, using some professional software, mapping software. So uh, you all know what their projects are like. So this is the student Alex Streeter in 2005 putting together his solar box from the inside, after which we lifted it over him and got him out. And then with a little more money, we were able to refine that and make it more ergonomic. So we uh, sort of put this on the robot and, and um, hinge it together and can get inside to instruments. This is sort of a little bit of a rat's nest that we <laughs> cobbled together back then. It worked, but it was not pretty that we, that we uh, cleaned up afterwards. But fundamentally, the robot itself, the chassis, which is actually made out of tech clam, sort of a composite material with a, um, almost a cardboard core and a, uh, a fiberglass skin. We essentially took this sheet of tech clam, um, cut it and folded it into this box and epoxied it together. And that epoxy is hold, has held for the last decade. So very simple design. So, at this point, in 2005, we had one robot, and then a, a design team uh, came along, a B design team. We had zero dollars at that point, and did a paper design of Yeti. And uh, um, then a couple years later, I got some money, and another B group followed that with, with building Yeti. And Yeti has been fielded actually more than the cool robot has been fielded. So these are some of the deployments for Yeti. I think Yeti's been deployed maybe a dozen times total north and south. And at some points, it was going to Antarctica, coming back for a couple weeks, and then going up north, and coming back, and then going back down south. So I think that happened a couple years running. Yeti was actually the brainchild of a, a scientist and a graduate at uh, Krell, Steve Arconi, who said, wouldn't it be great to have a, a robot to do ground penetrating radar surveys? So, so this is how they do it now. They have this big tractor, and they have a boom uh, on, the, on the tractor that holds an antenna at the end, a six-meter six boom. And uh, this is what they're trying to find. So the tractor will come along here with the boom out in front. And when it sees the uh, uh, image of the crevasse, in the, when, the, when the operator sees that, they have a couple of seconds to stop the tractor before the <laughs> tractor is over that crevasse. So, be nice if we had a lightweight robot would tow it in back, and it could cross that without falling through, so it could and bring the radar record back to the to the operator. So uh, these two groups designed and constructed and did all the electronics and controls for Yeti, and now we had to to uh, cut our teeth and and prove that it was useful, and we did that by supporting lo logistics. So this is that crevasse detection 
so you have this radar return. You have to know what the signature looks like. Uh, I see that void with these parabolic reflections. It's continually scrolling across the, the, the screen. You're doing this for 8 to 12 hours a day. It's tedious. It's stressful. It's boring. And yet, if you don't find the crevasse, you can fall through. This is one where they passed over. They didn't see that one, and then it, it opened up afterwards. So bad things can happen, and uh, so we were there to help uh, uh, prevent that. So one of our uh, largest successes in this area was the surveying the Greenland Inland Helping Survey, the Green Greenland Inland Traverse Route. And both uh, Greenland and Antarctica, there is a route for overland supply of the South Pole, and in this case, the summit station from the coast, which is a lot less expensive than flying supplies in by airplane. And what you see here in green are the crevasses that are seen from aerial surveys. And in red is their 2012 route, and in green is their 2000, or in yellow is their 2011 route. And the crevasse field changes substantially from year to year. So they can't take the same route every year, and they have to resurvey. And this is done with that, that piston bully, that manual tractor, normally. But what Yeti uh, could do was, uh, so if this is their route, could go back and forth and back and forth across their route to say, where is the next crevasse? So they're kind of snaking their way. And these are not separated by more than a, a hundred meters or, or so, maybe a couple hundred. And while we were doing that, we were also gathering data for ourselves so that we could develop a way to automate the process of detecting crevasses. So one of my students, Becca Williams, uh, took this data. So what we did is when we knew where there was a crevasse, we did these rosette kind of patterns around that. So we got many different crossings at many different angles. And uh, because the crevasses are hard to see when you cross them at shallow angles, she was able to develop a software classifier that uh, took that as training data and learned how to classify crevasses. And so this is an example of her results. So this is an expert hand labeling crevasses, and this is her automatic labeling of it. So now we have a method that can use software to find the crevasses in the radar records as it's scrolling. And we're hoping now in the next couple of years to now implement that in real time on the robot. So, We've actually done some of our own engineering, but mostly we've done this in the context of supporting the logistics. So now that we've proved ourselves, uh, proven our capabilities with the logistics, we finally got this science project that uh, culminated with a deployment in 2013, uh, where we carried two instruments. We carried uh, this aerosol package from the U uh, University of New Hampshire that looked at the uh, pollutants carried by the plume of the station across the Greenland ice sheet. So <clears throat> we did surveys with the robots sort of fanning out to look at the, the plume dis uh, dispersion. And we also used radar to look at uh, the snow and fern related to a, a, a once in a blue moon 2012 melt event in Greenland. So this was a case where this is an ice sheet that doesn't melt, and this year it did for uh, reasons that scientists hypothesize are re actually related to forest fires and, and how they change the albedo of the ice sheet. But in any case, we were looking at the distribution of, of uh, features in the snow and fern related to this uh, event by doing small grids uh, spaced uh, around, around the, uh, the station. So this is an example of the kind of grid we can do with our robot. This is about 200 by 200 meters. And we can do parallel lines with about 10, 5, 10 meter spacings very easily with our, our navigation. So we can do pretty straight lines. Probably hard to do even with a snowmobile, a, 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 a human driven snowmobile. So that was our first uh, successful science experiment, finally, after about uh, eight years at this. And currently, we have a, a, an even larger survey experiment. This is the first time both robots have been deployed together. And in this uh, particular project, we're trying to uh, gather data that our collaborators at the University of Maine can use to develop an ice sheet mechanics model of the McMurdo uh, ice sheet. And this is basically a tongue of, of ice that extends over the sea that moves. It's probably the biggest 
part of the biggest ice sheet in Antarctica, and they want to know what the health of that ice sheet is and how it's uh, melting and, and uh, reacting over time. So we are doing surveys over three consecutive years. We did our first one this fall, as well as laying out a strain gauge grid using a GPS for looking at the motion of the sheet. And so what we're getting back from this are, are, are things like this. So this is our grid. This is actually the shear zone. And this is a 5 kilometer by 5.7 kilometer grid. And this is a 100 lines transects that we did with the robot um, to gather uh, GPO, uh, ground penetrating radar data with two different radars, one that looked in the top 15 meters and another that looked all the way down to about 175 meters to the, where the sea ice meets the, uh, the ice sheet. And uh, what we found so far is, is stunning. So this is an example. So this is five kilometer radar record. And uh, as we pass over that shear zone, there's tons of crevassing almost up to the surface. Some of these are about a foot underneath the surface. And then at the bottom uh, of the ice sheet, you see, you can't see and I can't see, but the experts in radar can see similar crevassing matching the top. So, our, our goal here is to look at uh, the middle of this a little more carefully by uh, adjusting our radar center settings in the coming years. But just to put this in perspective, before we did this study, the most that scientists had was a single transect, which they obtained using a manned vehicle, holding their breath that uh, they wouldn't pass a crevasse, which was going to cause them to fall. So, so, so the robot can do things that are just simply impossible for a man survey to do. Uh, so what about the future? Well, we are hoping to start a project within the next year that uh, actually uses the robots now to study, to help uh, study climate change. And how can a robot do that? Well, NASA operates a number of satellites that um, make measurements to inform climate models, particularly mass balance of ice sheets. So here's the Greenland ice sheet. We have accumulation at the high elevations. We have ablation or melt off at the lower elevations. And the only data we have to measure the important parameters, the albedo, the compaction, the accumulation, are either these single stations that are sparsely distributed or satellite data where we do a pass through of, of one of the ice sheets. And it measures some quantity over, let's say, a uh, 100 kilometer by 100 kilometer area. So how? How uniform are the properties within that area? What are we missing? So uh, with a robot, we can fill this in by doing surveys over regions that are tens of kilometers by tens of kilometers, measuring these properties and reducing the uncertainty in those mass balance models so that we can say with more cer uh, certainty how fast our ice sheets are uh, melting, how much is sea level going to rise, and we can ground truth the uh, NASA satellite measurements. So that's, that's hopefully in our future. So I'll conclude there, and um, I can't conclude, of course, without uh, thanking and recognizing partners and students. So this is the whole list of students that over the years have been involved in this project, as BE, AB, and then finally graduate students, and then a number of collaborators, and also my, my funding sources. So uh, thank you for your attention, and I'll, I guess we have a few minutes for questions. Uh, there have been many vehicles lost. So another uh, of Yeti's logistic surveys was the old South Pole Station. This is the one from the 50s buried under like 30 feet of snow now. And they wanted to use that area for travel because it's near the new station. And so they, they went out and surveyed that with a tractor uh, pushing a radar and it fell through. And I think then the one that went out to rescue it fell through. And then they said, can we borrow the robot? So, yeah, so, uh, and there have, and there have been, I think there have been a couple of uh, airplane landings uh, way back. Uh, yeah, so occasionally, not in recent years have they had an accident, but it does happen. Yeah. Well, so um, if there's an open crevasse, we can see it from the air, right? So we're, we're avoiding those. And, but uh, the robot is, is very unlikely to fall through because the ground pressure is so low. Um, maybe a, a, not quite, just over 2 PSI or less. 
So we're really not putting a lot of pressure on, on, on these. And the time we get there, so by the time we get there in the fall, any new crevasses have bridged but with at least a, a, a foot of snow, so they're adequate, and the, you know they're, they may be narrow as well. So we haven't, knock on wood, <laughs> ever had a problem. So we ship the robots in August, and the robots go overland to um, Port Wainimi and uh, sort of Southern California. Then they get shipped by uh, ship. To uh, New Zealand, and then we, they get put on the plane. So uh, it takes about you know, a month and a half for the robots to get there, and that's the least expensive way to get them there. So that's why we use that. Uh, but the humans actually fly. <laughs> Is your data stored on board, or do you do live telemetry when you're doing the CPR? Uh, we, we, we don't have the bandwidth to do live telemetry, so it's stored on board and uh, comes back. So that's why we want to be able to do this in real time so that the robot is processing the data as it gets it and then it can flag so we can easily send a flag via telemetry but to send the whole data set would be difficult. Uh, right, so when we are um, within range, radio range, we send back a bunch of telemetry just to tell us what the robot's doing, where it is, what waypoint it just hit, and we can, it doesn't call for help so much, but if you see that it's just been sitting there in the same spot for the last minute, then you know, you know something's wrong, yeah. So, um, uh, we haven't implemented completely because we really haven't needed to, but at one point we envisioned a, a number of modes, sort of like a state machine, uh, where, uh, for example, uh, if it was blizzard conditions, the robot would sort of stop and then once in a while move to prevent getting snowed in. Uh, we actually haven't done any um, really long traverses where we've been away from the robot. So this one, this five by five, uh, kilometer grid was 600 kilometers total, but we were always within um, a few kilometers of the robot, even though it was a long, a long outing. But we've not quite gone out 200 kilometers and come back yet, and so that's still in our future. Are you more focused now on data gathering in the robots, or are you still working on, I'll call it improvements in the uh, power systems, uh, transport system, et cetera? That's a good question. So we find that it's hard to get money just to do the engineering. So we get money to do the science and hide some money to do the engineering. We don't really hide it, but we, we, we say what we're going to do to make that science possible. So we're working on both, but we wish we had more money for the, for the engineering. We, we do what we can. So for example, um, the Cool Robots power system is very complex. And you can't test it here at these temperatures and, and this environment. You have to touch, test it up uh, in the environment it's going to be used. But the field time, of course, is very expensive. So one of the projects that we tacked on to this last one, the, the climate study, uh, change study, <clears throat> is to revamp the power system so it's simpler and that we could test it here before sending it to the field. Um, and, and that will make it increase its reliability. Another thing, for example, we'd like to be able to do is to, um, just like we'd like to respond to crevasses, we'd like to engineer sort of general purpose software so you can take in some data, process it, and then respond to it, change your trajectory, do something different based on the data. And so we've added that to that. So it's a small piece of the project, but it allows us to do uh, the engineering as well as support the science. <clears throat> 